And it's funny, we get into the, the Christmas season and it's like, boom, we're into it. And then it's just like, poof, the train starts rolling, the music all changes, eggnog's on sale. Who's excited about eggnog? My wife bought me eggnog yesterday and I was like, hallelujah, salvation is near. I'm an eggnog fan. Uh, also one of those kind of divisive things. Some people hate the eggnog. But we get into the Christmas season, right? And it's like immediately we get going. And it's so easy to forget the context that Christmas is around. Now, notice I didn't say it's so easy to forget the reason for the season. No, no, no. What I think we forget more than just Jesus and Christmas is we actually forget that there is a context into which Jesus was born. You following? There's a world in which Jesus came into, and he came to the world for a reason. And he was expected, and it was planned. And so what I want to do over this series is help us understand the context of Christmas a little bit better. And that means that we're going to be hanging out in the book of Isaiah for three weeks. I've been doing a personal study in Isaiah uh, for the last three months or so, and I've just been having a blast. So I was like, I'm just going to subject the church to it for three weeks. It's going to be awesome. Isaiah is an intense book. Let me tell you, it is super intense. It's super kind of, um, it feels a little bit all over the map. It's got, it's got like, you name it, it's got, it's got violence, it's got stories, it's got poetry. It is, it is the bomb. You got to go read Isaiah. Now, when Jesus came, before we get to Isaiah, every single gospel, every single one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four main stories about Jesus, Every single one of them contains a reference to Isaiah chapter 40. Every one of them. And yet, I don't know how often we actually go back and say, wait a second. If every single gospel introduces Jesus out of Isaiah chapter 40, maybe we should pay attention to Isaiah 40. Check it out. Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Right, so every gospel kind of opens with some variant of this text. And the question is, what is going on? Why is it there? Why did Jesus have to come? And what were people expecting? What, what's this all... About, so what I want to do is I want to read Isaiah 40, since we just quoted it. Let's just go and read it. Starting in verse 1. It'll be on the screens. There you go. Okay, here we go. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for her sins. This is sounding like Christmas. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I said, what should I shout about? Shout that people are like grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountain, mountaintop. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their young. Let's pray as we get into it tonight. Lord, as we study this passage of scripture that maybe seems disconnected or, or hard to relate to as it in the world of Christmas and in the busyness of December. God, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, Lord, for your word tonight. Jesus, I pray that my words would not be the words that are spoken, but that you would speak out of your scriptures tonight. Lord, for those that are weary and, and tired, a little bit frustrated awaiting, God, I pray, I pray that you would speak life tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 
So is that, have any of you ever had to wait for something? Like wait like a long time. Maybe you're like, I'm waiting for my wife. And she's not arrived yet. Come on, somebody. My wife, so you know wives, has been waiting on me for a very long time to clean my office. Like I mean a long time. I was like, okay, it's been like six months. And I started cleaning my office yesterday, and I found papers in there from like 2014, 2013. We're going like three years since I cleaned my office. I kid you not, I had a pile this high of papers and junk. And I was like, oh, my gosh. My wife is a graciously patient woman. And I've been, I was cleaning through it. I was like, oh, it's totally going to take me ten minutes. Four hours later, I was still weeding through, like, mortgage papers and insurance papers and bills and, like, just junk. And I was like, ooh, good thing my car's still insured. Nice. So anyway, I was flipping through, and I, I found this, like, somewhere in the bottom of the pile. This is my journal. And it's proof that you don't have to buy a $20 fancy moleskin to journal. You can do it with the $2 version from Walmart. If you got nothing out of this sermon, boom, there you go. I speak freedom over the insanity that is journals. Anyway. Um, and I found my journal. And there's a date here. It says December 7th, 2007. Pretty cool. That's like almost 10 years ago, nine years ago, almost to a day. And nine years ago, I found this journal. And I want to read you what I wrote. I was praying. And I was praying for this, a radical. This is 19-year-old me. In fact, I wasn't even 19. I was still 18. And I prayed this over our church here at Lyft. Lyft was eight months old at the time, nine months old. And I said, Lord, I, I pray for a radical, subversive, compassionate community of followers of Jesus. I want the leadership of Lyft to foster that. But it must be their heart first. But this is dangerous. Being radical is dangerous. Being subversive can be dangerous. Even being compassionate can be dangerous. But faith in Jesus is dangerous. Give us the courage, the vision to be dangerous. Help us to undermine a dry, boring, irrelevant Christianity. While at the same time subverting culture. I prayed that almost 10 years ago, nine years ago. And if you flip through, you can actually find a set of prayers going back November, and on they, on they go back, October. And I remember I was young, and I'd just been a part of Planting Lift, and I had this heart to see this church planted. And this heart to see Jesus start to do things in this church. You go and read, and, and I kept reading, I was reading about prayers that I would Maybe one day preach or speak or one day that I would see people come to faith. That there would be salvation in our church. And as I prayed those prayers, I remember I had a sense that I was going to have to be patient. And I tucked most of these away for a matter of years. Three years later, Live Church was just about ready to close its doors. And, uh, and I remember I was waiting. And I was waiting. And I was still waiting at that point, five years in, going, God, when are you going to move? When are you going to do what I feel you have called this church to do? When are you going to accomplish your plans and your purposes? And I remember I was starting to get a little bit weary, a little bit tired of waiting. In fact, you can read about it if I look into my newer journals. This is the context of Isaiah 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, the people that are receiving this message, let's just say they're a little bit weary. What's happened is that the people of, of Judah have, or Israel have not honored God with their lives. They've not lived faithfully. In fact, they've lived the opposite of faithful. They've been up to all kinds of craziness. And so the Babylonians come in and they conquer the people. And they take them off 1,500 kilometers it's like walking from here to Florida, I would imagine. Doesn't sound like a pretty good deal. And, 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 and they take them 1,500 kilometers to Babylon in captivity. Their city, Jerusalem, is in ruins. It's been burned to a crisp. You have to understand that for the people of Israel, the land was something that God had directly promised them. And they're turning around going, God, you have confiscated our land. It's in ruins. It's in ruins. 
and they become slaves and servants of the Babylonian people. It almost seems like God has forgotten them. They've been in captivity for generations at this point. I think most significantly, the, the glory of God, you have to understand that the people of Israel thought and understood that they were given the gift of God's presence that, was, that they were to carry with them wherever they went and was housed in the temple, but the temple was in ruins. The glory of God had, had left them, so they're sitting there going, God, what are you going to do? We feel a little bit abandoned. We feel a little bit stuck and weary. I don't know if there's anyone in the house tonight that's feeling a little bit weary. A little bit like you've been slogging up against the wall for so long that you've begun to doubt God's faithfulness. That you've begun to doubt whether or not God's word is actually true. You've begun to doubt whether or not there's actually something here. That's where the people in Babylon found themselves. They're sitting there going, we've been in captivity a long time. We're weary. We're tired. You can read about it in the book of Isaiah. It's this long narrative. But it says this in verse 1. And if there's two words I pray you walk away with, if you walk away with nothing else, walk away with these two words tonight. If you're weary and you're tired, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. The people are sitting there and they're worn out and they're losing hope. And into the middle of that, God says, I see and I care. I see and I care. You see, what God is doing is in this moment, he is speaking a word of hope to a people that have lost hope. He is speaking a word of encouragement to a people that have lost belief that there is a way out of the captivity. And if you walk away with nothing else tonight, I pray that you walk away with those two words, comfort. Justice is coming. Goodness is coming. There is a way where the Lord is going to move. Now, you see, here's the thing. If I just leave it there, it goes, well, that's not very specific, Robin. Comfort, comfort my people. God's saying comfort, but what does he mean? What does that look like? I'm, maybe you're sitting going, Robin, I'm, I'm tired. I had a meeting this morning with some of our team, and, and a lot of them said to me, you know, we're tired. We're tired. I know in December, it's a, it's a tiring season. And you're going, Robin, it's nice that you say that the Lord is saying comfort, comfort, but, but what does that look like, and what on earth does that have to do with Christmas? Well, check it out. Check it out. This is awesome. Isaiah 40, verse 3. Listen. It is the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Now you have to understand that the wilderness here is referring to the desolation of Israel. It's referring to the brokenness that was once their home. Clear a way for the Lord because he is coming. When, Lord, when, the, when God says comfort, comfort, my people, he doesn't just say comfort, come there, there. And disengage. No, no, no. God's response when he says comfort, comfort, is to then step into the world. To step into your situation. To step into what's going on in this earth and say, I'm going to personally involve myself. I'm going to personally invest. And you see, it's no coincidence that, that John the Baptist, that every gospel refers to John the Baptist quoting exactly this. Clear a way for the Lord because there is something coming. There is something coming. I think many of us, when we get tired and we get weary, we start to go, I don't know. Doesn't, does God care? Is he interested in what's happening in my world? Is he invested? And yet Isaiah's opening words here, when he starts to describe what God is going to do, he says God is going to step in. He's going to step into the brokenness. I don't know what's going on in your world tonight. 
But these words that Isaiah spoke to the, to the exiles, these words that were quoted when Jesus starts to come, still are true today. God is still a God that steps into the midst of our world and involves himself and takes it upon himself to say, I care enough to step into and move your situation. And maybe tonight you don't believe that God can move in your world. Stand on the scriptures. God is a God that steps into our world. He's the God that steps into the brokenness and the confusion that we walk with and says, I am going to make a way. I am going to make a way. Now, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. God promises and he announces here that he's going to come. He announces that he's going to come and John the Baptist announces Jesus coming as this coming that Isaiah writes about. He says, no, 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 you guys thought it was here 600 years before, but it's actually right now. Jesus is coming. This is it that's happening. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Whenever God moves in the scriptures, go and study them front to back. You'll find this. Whenever God moves in the scriptures, his move is coupled to our response. A move of God is almost always coupled to a response from us. It's almost always coupled to a response from us. I think sometimes you're sitting there saying, God, you need a move in my world. You need, you need to do something. It's right here. I'm looking at it. You need to do something. And we start yelling at God, but meanwhile we're sitting here clinging and saying, I'm not, willing, I'm not willing to take any steps. I'm not willing to respond. I'm not willing to walk with you, God. I just want to point the finger and tell you what to do. So Isaiah writes this, he says in verse 4, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. All right, question. It's a bit of a complicated question, I must warn you. Is Isaiah talking about a physical mountain getting in God's way? Like, is God, is God sitting there going, uh, the Alps are in the way. I don't know. What mountains are between Babylon and Jerusalem? I'm not sure. I'm not a geography expert. Not the Alps, for the record. I, my geography is not that bad. But is God sitting there going, oh, man, there's a mountain? No, of course not. Right? He's God. Isaiah is not talking about literally getting the mountains out of the way, although there was probably mountains and valleys and streams and rivers and all kinds of things separating the captives in Babylon from Jerusalem. In this text, the mountains and the valleys are a metaphor for the condition of people's hearts. And what Isaiah is saying here is he's saying, you guys were, are you waiting for God to move, but are you willing to have a good solid look at what's going on in your heart? Are you willing to have a good solid look at what's happening inside of you that's maybe holding God at a distance? This is why when John the Baptist quotes when, when this text is coupled to John the Baptist, John the Baptist stands and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What does repent mean? Like, whoa, this just got heavy all of a sudden. Repent means to, to turn around, to turn around. When Isaiah talks about filling in the valleys and removing the mountains, what he's saying is what's going on in your heart that is preventing God from moving in your world. We're weary and we're tired, say the captives. And Isaiah says, okay, come on, let's sort out this heart issue. Let's sort out this heart issue. Have a conversation about what's going on in your heart. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Some of us are going, I have been struggling with addiction for a long time. I've been wrestling through this issue of addiction in my life. God, you need to break this free. You need to give me freedom from this. And we've been praying and we've been yearning. But then we come to the scriptures that say confess to one another and we go, hold up, hold up. No, no, mm -mm, mm, no, mm. not doing it. No, God. You need to sort this out in me. I'm not willing to tell somebody else about what's going on in me. Or maybe, maybe you're sitting there going, God, you need to provide in my future. I'm really nervous about my future. I'm really nervous about what job I'm going to get or what's going to happen in my world. And I'm, I'm weary of trying to wrestle through it. So, God, you need, to, you need to make a way. You need to help me do it. And meanwhile, God's sitting there going, oh, man, I'm about to start preaching at myself. He's about to start. Have you, have you been caring about me in your life? 
or you're just interested in productivity. I'm preaching to myself right now. Are you, you're, you're, you're weary and you're tired, but you don't seem to be wanting to invite me into the process, so. Hmm. Or maybe you're sitting there going, my, 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 my relationship is just so stuck in a rut. I can't seem to break through in the area of relationships in my world. But have you been willing to go, God, I trust you with my relationships. And I'm willing to release them and let go of them to you. You see, what Isaiah is saying here is he's saying, God is going to move in your world. That's a promise. You can stand on that promise. But is your heart ready to receive the move of God in your world? Is your heart ready? Like, are you ready if God moves? Or when you look at the story of Christmas, are you ready to receive what Jesus has done? Or are you just going to hold it at a distance? Yeah, you can put it over there. I have a confession. Um, confession time. I was talking about confession. Here's my confession. I have a problem when it comes to cookies. It's a true story. Um, there's some people who it's like, you know, like I should have had, I accidentally ate, you know, three cookies. There's some of you that are, you know, a little bit bad that are like, I, I accidentally ate, you know, the whole row. My confession is that I just take the whole box back to my desk. And I'm just like, nom, 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 cookies. <laughs> and I just literally will demolish the whole box. This is me. I'm just working away. And like just nonstop. You're like, you surely don't look like you eat a lot of cookies. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> Diet of cookies and jube jubes. That's what powers lift church. <laughs> but sometimes what we do is we're like, this is my attitude. I'm, I'm like into the box. I'm like, you know. Three quarters of the row into row, th you know, two of three. And I look at the box and I go, I really shouldn't eat nine more cookies. But I've already had, you know, 21, so <laughs> what's nine more? <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> see, this is what we do is we go, well, I'm already this far gone, so maybe God can't move in my world. I'm already, I'm already 21 cookies into the sin thing, and I, I don't believe God can move. And what Isaiah says here is he says, God is going to move. He is going to step in. He is going to involve himself. You are not too far gone. Stop eating the cookies. Turn around. It's a hilarious analogy. I'm just, my brain is going all kinds of crazy places. But we do this, right? We, 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 we believe that we're too far into it. We're too far removed for God to move. You are not too far. You are not too far tonight. God is saying, I want to move in your world. Will you let me in? What's going on in your heart? What are those, what are those mountains? What are those mountains that Isaiah is talking about tonight in your world? I think if you have a good, solid look at what's going on inside, you know what mountains I'm talking about. You know where you're going, ah. I've been keeping God at a distance because I'd rather just keep that mountain in place, separating us. And what, what Isaiah is saying is, put him down. What John the Baptist is, is turn around. Jesus is coming. He wants in. He wants to make a way. He wants to make a way into your life. Will you let him in? The mountain isn't too big. The valley isn't too low. The exiles had done some pretty terrible stuff to get themselves in that situation, and yet they received this word that says God is coming. He wants in. He wants into your world tonight. He wants into your heart tonight. Stop holding him at a distance. Let him in this evening. Now, one of the things that happens when... We get tired and we get weary. And this is, I think, a season where that happens, you know, is that we start to question two things. Two things get called into question when we get really tired. If you're anything like me and the many people I've talked to through the years, these seem pretty true. The first is that we begin to doubt ourselves. We begin to doubt our self-confidence and our identity. 
Number one, we get tired immediately. It's like, I can't do it. But more significantly, the second thing we do is we start to, dar- we start to doubt God's promises. And we start to say, God, I know you promised, but I don't believe it because I'm tired. Check it out. Isaiah 40 verse 5 says, God's going to come, prepare the way, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. Now, for the people in captivity, this would have been a reminder of the promises of God. Remember I said promises. We start to doubt God's promises. This is a reminder of those promises. Now, imagine you've been sitting in captivity for a couple of generations And the glory of the Lord is left. You don't know anything about glory. You see, the thing is, that's central to the identity of the Jewish people that I I was talking about of the Israelites, was that their job was to carry the glory of God. And Isaiah is saying here, when God comes, his glory is going to be revealed. But if they had been in captivity, their parents, and their parents' parents, and their parents' parents' parents would not have experienced this. This promise that the glory of the Lord will be revealed is just a nice idea at this point. Something they certainly tried to rest on, but how do you rest on something you haven't experienced? You see, the glory of the Lord defined the Israelites, but they hadn't experienced it for so long that they didn't know what it was. And in fact, the glory never came back. For the next 500 years, the people of Israel wrestled without this glory coming back. You see, when we get weary and we get worn out, we start to question God's promises and we start to question our own identity. But what Isaiah does in this moment is he starts to point back to a promise. He starts to point back to a promise to say, hey, hey, God promised. His glory is coming. But you see, when we think about Christmas, for how many of us is it just a story? Just Christmas happened, I think, maybe. And we're, we're going through the Christmas season and we're like, yep, yep, it's just a story. The manger, the, the shepherds, maybe one day we'll have a sweet production. Next year I'll get my baby girl to play baby Jesus. I don't think that's sacrilegious. <laughs> we'll do Christmas production in 1280. The whole nother level. I'm just starting to dream up some crazy stuff right now. But for how many of us have we, we go through the Christian thing, and it's just a story. You hear the story of Jesus coming, like, great, it's just a story. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. Great, it's just a story. Maybe we try to put some hope in it, but ah, it's just a story. You see, when we start to wait on what God is going to do in our lives, often we start to doubt his promises. And things that were designed to be realities become just stories. Nine years ago when I prayed these prayers in this journal, I started to look back on them yesterday as I was reading them. Almost every single prayer that I prayed nine years ago, God has answered. And you can read page after page. I can remember month after month going, God, I don't know. I don't know. But I want it. You see, what we start to do is we start to doubt God's promises when we get weary and we get tired. We start to say, well, I don't know, God, if you can do it. But fundamentally, what Isaiah is pointing to is he's saying, people, I need you to trust God's promises even though you can't see them. I need you to trust God's promises even though you can't see them. But then he says something in the next verse that is critical to understanding this passage. It says, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. You see, the captives would have thought that the glory of the Lord was for them. And so they're sitting in captivity going, God, we need your glory back. You promised. Come on, let's hook us up. Let's go. 
And they would have understood it to only be them. But you see, what we start to do when we start to doubt God's promises and we start to focus on what's immediately in front of us is we take the vision that God has and we start to jam it into a box. We start to jam it into a box. Oh, God, you have plans and purposes for my life. Well, I'm just going to fit them into this little box right here. Are you cool with that? I'm going to take your vision and I'm going to put it in this box. But you see, when God says, and, the, and all people, this would have been radical. This would have made no sense. The glory of the Lord was not for all people. It was for the Israelites. And you see, over 500 years later when Jesus arrives, Jesus arrives to declare that, in fact, the glory is for all people. But they missed it. They missed it. For 500 years, they missed it. You see, what we want to do is we want to put our vision and our hopes and, and what's going on in our world based on what is directly in front of us. This year, this month, this is the challenge. So God, your capacity to move is dictated by this current challenge. And what God is saying, would you start to see the world from my perspective? Would you start to have hopes and dreams from my perspective? How many of you have taken the dreams that God has placed on your heart and cut them back so that they fit into a nice little box? How many of you have taken the plans and purposes that God has for you and made them contingent on the outcome of a single exam? God, if, if I pass this exam, then I'm going to be in your purposes, and if I don't, then I'm done. How many of you have, have built it up on a relationship, right? If this, if this works out, then we're good, God, then, my, then your vision for my life is going to pan out. But if it doesn't, then... And what God is saying here is, is, my vision for your life, my vision for this earth is bigger. Would you stop putting me in a little box? Would you stop trying to contain me? But you see, when we're weary and when we're tired, when we're in the proverbial captivity, we start to put God in a little box. You see, when your situation is desperate and you're tired, I think that is an opportunity to turn around and say, God, okay, come on. Make my vision bigger. Help me to see what you're seeing here, God. See, Jesus broke the mold. When Jesus comes at Christmas, what he does is he blows it open. Wide open. He takes this verse in Isaiah and he starts to demonstrate that it actually fits into a much bigger narrative, a much bigger picture of what's happening in this world. I think the question is, can we actually trust God's promises? See, the people of Israel, when they eventually return from captivity, they, they actually really didn't see it come true. They didn't. They, they returned to Jerusalem, and it was kind of a shadow of what was. The temple that they rebuilt was not as good. And in fact, one, one um, ancient author writes about the, the, the captivity that's restored, and it's like they, it was so lame what they walked into that they called the province that was like the new, um, the new Israel kind of. It was ruled by other people. They called it the province on the other side of the river, like the province over there. It was so lame that they didn't even give it a legitimate name. And you see, it's interesting because God's making all these promises and what they step into is only a shadow of it, which is where verse 8 comes into the picture. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Maybe tonight what you need to start doing is start seeing your world in light of eternity and stop seeing eternity in light of your world. It's a little bit of a, of a mouthy saying, so I'm going to say it again for you tonight. Maybe what you need to start doing is start saying, God, what are you saying about what's going on in my world? Instead of saying, my world, what do you say about God? You need, and we as a church need to be people that start seeing our lives in light of eternity instead of eternity in light of our lives. We need to start to see our lives in light of the word of God instead of the word of God in light of our lives. And you see, that's what this text says. It says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. 
And you see, what happens is in the moment of a struggle, in the moment of our weariness, in the moment of being tired, in the moment of being burned out, in the moment of being confused, a moment feels like eternity, doesn't it? We feel like we're wrestling and we're wrestling and that there's never going to be breakthrough. But you see, in light of eternity, our entire lives are but a moment. And would we start to view them that way, not as invaluable or unvaluable, unvaluable, but actually part of a scheme that God is working through eternity. You see, when we start to see God's word in the grand scheme of things, start to say, God, what's your word? What's your plan in eternity? Help me understand it. Then instead of looking at our world and allowing it to define everything, we start to go, okay, God, what are you doing? How do I fit into it? You see, it's amazing that even though our lives are like a blip on the radar, the scripture says here, what's God's response? He steps into the world. He steps into this blip, into this moment of time 2,000 years ago as Jesus and says, I care enough to enter the world, to do something about it. And so the question for us tonight is, can we trust God's word? Can we trust God's character in the midst of those seasons where a moment feels like eternity? Can we trust his word to say, God, you are faithful and you are true? In verse 9, there are four words that he promises. Your God is coming. Your God is coming. But you see, we stand on the other side of those four words. Our God has come. Our God has come. His name is Jesus, and he has come to bring hope to the world. You see, it's they stood on the other side of the scripture going, your God is coming, and we're standing on the other side of it going, our God has come. And here's the crazy thing. He has come and he has commissioned each one of you to go and point other people to discover this hope in Jesus, this hope in our God. It says the glory of the Lord will be revealed to all people and it was in Jesus and it's our job. We get the privilege of telling people about that. Your God is coming. Your God has come. Maybe you've walked in tonight and you're feeling weary, like you're in the wilderness. Maybe you're feeling lost and forsaken. Maybe you're feeling like, like you're stuck. Check it out, verse 10. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will rule with a powerful arm. Maybe you feel like the change of death. The chains of death are around your ankles. You're going, I can't seem to break free from what's happening. The, the Lord is coming in power. His arm is an arm of power. He has freedom. Jesus, it says Jesus came to set the captives free. Maybe you need to hear that tonight, that the Lord has power to move in your world. The question is, will you let him in? Will you let him move? But maybe that's not where you're at tonight. Maybe you're going, I'm just in one of those sit down moments and you're, you're weary and you're tired. Listen to the other side of what Jesus has. And then he will feed his flock. This is verse 11. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. He will carry the lambs. He will carry us in his arms, holding them close to his heart. The Apostle Peter calls Jesus the great shepherd. First Peter. And maybe you need to know that the Lord is sitting there. If you're going weary, would you come to me? See, Jesus is both the powerful arm of God and the tender mercy of God. And so the picture that Isaiah paints is found in the Christmas story in Jesus coming. There was generations upon generations upon generations of people who had to put their hope in what was yet to come. And we get to be a part 
of generations upon generations upon generations of people saying the hope has come. The hope has come tonight. His name is Jesus. He is life. He is goodness. So come on, church, let's pray as we wrap up this evening. Close things down. If that's you and you're in the place tonight and you're saying, Robin, I'm weary. I'm tired. I don't like the word, but maybe, maybe the word burnout is the word you would use to describe. Maybe you feel like you've been in captivity and you're stuck. The Lord is coming in power tonight. He came in power 2,000 years ago in Jesus. There is freedom in this place. If that's you, if you're saying, Ron, I, I'm weary and I'm tired and I need the Lord to move in my world. If that's you, why don't you just throw your hand up real quick? Yeah, yeah, everywhere. All, awesome. Once it's up, you can put it down. Yeah, almost the whole room. Lord, I pray for those that have raised their hands this evening to say, I'm tired, God. Lord, I pray that you would speak a life into them this evening. God, that you would speak encouragement. God, that where people feel stuck, God, that you would bring freedom. God, for those that have mountains that they've erected, whether it's mountains of a hard heart or mountains of holding you at bay or mountains of their own decision making and, and sin, God. I pray that there would be freedom tonight in this place. God, that you would lay low those mountains, that you would fill in those valleys, that you would, God, that you would straighten the highway. God, that there would be a relationship with you tonight, that there would be no barrier. Jesus, it says, Jesus, you came so that we could have direct access to the creator of the universe. And Father, I pray tonight that there would be no barrier. Just as we close, if you're here tonight and, and you've never encountered this church thing before and you've never given your life to Jesus or you've never come to faith and you're saying, I want to I wanna explore this. I want to I wanna explore what it means to walk with Jesus, to have a relationship with Jesus. If that's you tonight, why don't you raise your hand real quick? Is anyone else tonight here that's saying, yeah, I want to walk with Jesus or have a relationship with Jesus for the first time? If that's you tonight, why don't you raise your hand? Yeah. Awesome. Jesus, we praise you tonight. God, I pray that there would be freedom in this place, that there would be encouragement in this place, that there would be life in this place. God, thank you for building your church. Thank you that your promises are true and trustworthy. Thank you, God. You know, if that's you tonight and you're saying, I'm tired, why don't you come on up for prayer this evening? I'm gonna be some people praying at the front. I'm gonna release you guys to go for a fantastic week. Tons of great stuff happening. But if that's you, if you need prayer, I wanna encourage you to come on up for prayer. I'd love to pray with you or someone in the prayer team would love to pray with you. Or if you prefer, you can just stay where you're seated and someone will come to you. Otherwise, be blessed, church. Have a fantastic week. Love you guys. And we will see you just the 5.30 service next week.